All right, let's stand and worship the Lord this morning. And what a fellowship, what helps your divine leading on the everlasting arm. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine leading on the
Not because of anything that we could ever do, but because of His grace, because of His mercy this morning. Praise God. Aren't you so thankful today that you're going to see Him face to face one of these days? And I'm telling you, it ain't going to be very long. It ain't going to be very long before we see Him. Praise God. And I'm going home with Jesus in the twinkling of an eye. Slip up your hand and glorify his name this morning. Lord, we're here to worship you. We're here to glorify your name and to worship you this morning. We give praises to your name because there's no one like you and we can't wait for the day when you finally come and take us home. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And there's a peace I've come to know. Though my heart and flesh may fail And there's an anchor for my soul I can say it is well Jesus has overcome and the grave is overwhelmed The victory is won He is risen from the dead And I will rise when He
praise this morning. Amen. God bless you. I appreciate you being here this morning. And those who are going to be watching by internet with the crew next door getting all dinner ready. We've got a lot of families that are out today. A lot of people couldn't be with us today. Uh, some of them are sick. Some are, are, are ministering to family members that are sick. Some of them are having Christmas celebrations with extended family members. But we appreciate you being here with us. And uh, people go through difficulties and hardships and trials and tribulations this morning. I was in my pickup and, and, uh, and Sunday mornings, 103.9 does gospel, Southern Gospel or Gospel Music. Southern Gospel, Country Gospel anyway. And then the song come on and said, Jesus, hold my hand. We're going to sing that song, okay? So let's sing as I travel through this pilgrim land, there is a friend who walks with me. He leads me safely through the sinking sand. He is the Christ of Calvary. Well, this would be my prayer, dear Lord, each day to help me to the best I can.
Man, you may be seated this morning in this place if you'd like to. And silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, bright. Merry Christmas to you today is our uh, Christmas fellowship meal. 
And then uh, coming up on the, the 18th of December is our children's Christmas choir that will be gathering together. Don't forget, every Sunday morning, Sunday school is at 945, regular service at 1030. Children's Church will stay in here today. We, a lot of our children are not with us today anyway, but well, Children's Church will stay in here today. Wednesday night Bible studies at 6 o'clock, children's ministry and youth ministries as well. Uh, don't forget, next Sunday, we're going to move it to next Sunday. Next Sunday is our last mission, missions offering uh, for the year specifically taken up. That'll be next Sunday morning. Uh, so make sure you get your uh, uh, missions in uh, for a uh, finished year. And you can give any time during the month. Uh, we did uh, do our missions uh, purchases, uh, I think right at $2,100. So give the Lord a hand clap of praise for that for the month of December. And we appreciate y'all giving towards missions. We we did the, uh, the missions outreach Bibles and then purchased the Bibles and then, of course, met our missionaries, ob ob missionary obligations as well. And we appreciate y'all's faithfulness in doing so, okay? Uh, don't forget, uh, make sure your children are here during Children's Church for specifically next Sunday for sure for uh, children's choir practice and getting ready for that. All right, ushers are coming to wait for you for your Sunday morning tithe and offering. Thank you so much for giving a tithe and a free will offering led by the Holy Spirit, directed by the Word of God. This is your church. And uh, it is your responsibility to take care of it financially through your tithe and faithful giving. You've been faithful all year long, and we thank you for it, for your faithfulness and giving. You can't outgive the Lord, but at the same time, you can't purchase the Lord's favor either. The, your favor comes from Christ in obedience, by, led by the Holy Spirit, is to give to the work of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this offering I'm about to receive. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Now, coming up in the month of December, I don't know exactly what they may. I may do it Christmas Eve uh, during the day lunch. I'm not either Christmas day lunch or Christmas Eve lunch. or the, I don't know exactly what day I'm going to do it. But uh, I have about 70 pounds of catfish uh, for our next fish fry that is coming up. And uh, But we're going to go take the fish fryers and the fish, and we're going to go to the Randy Sam's Homeless Shelter up there in downtown Texas County, and we're going to cook fish and feed the, the people there, the homeless shelter, and the people that are outside. Some of them, they get full and they sleep outside. But we're going to go feed them a fish dinner. And uh, so we'll, we'll have the beans here. I'll get Lisa. We'll have all that ready to go. We'll do, have the beans ready, the coleslaw ready, and all that stuff. When we go, and they come up later, and then but we'll have some men up there cooking the fish. So if you want to help do that, just let me know. You, and I'll, I'll, I'll figure out this coming week the exact day we're going to do it. i got to talk to Randy Sam's up there and let them know we're coming and get that all scheduled. Amen? So uh, we'll give that opportunity to do so. It's good to have Ricky Black here today. Raise your hand, Ricky. I'm so, Brother, we've been together all my life. I've, far back, if I can remember my 42 years of life on this earth, that, oh, is it higher than that? So anyway, but far back as I was a little bitty kid, I remember Ricky. Well, I got a message. I got a young lady walked up to me yesterday and said, Ricky Black died. I said, excuse me? Ricky Black's dead. I said, he better not be because they ain't called me. <laughs> if you die, you call me first. I don't want to hear it through the grapevine, okay? Make sure your family knows you call Brother Matt because I don't want to get messages saying Ricky passed away or anybody passed away. I want to know from the person, from the family. So anyway, it's good to have you here, Ricky, because I sure hate to be planning your funeral right now because remember, we're going to have steak. That's our deal. Remember that? If you die... First, I'll make sure your family serves steak at the family center. Right. If I die first, you make sure they serve steak. I ain't doing no chicken. Everybody else gets chicken. But Matt and Ricky, we getting steak, bro. I ain't talking about no cheap steak, neither. I'm talking about the goose. All right, so appreciate y'all being here. Don't forget coming up. 
uh, on the uh, uh, children's ministry is going to stay in here. And then uh, there's a lot of families that are out today, a lot of families out. Sister Susie's not with us today. Her mother uh, has been struggling with a, a lung uh, disease, and she's got all Wayland's family over. And they, Susie went and cleaned the house for her yesterday. And she's over there. They're supposed to meet all in her house at lunch. And she, when, you, when that's new, and you, I, don't, I don't know if you've ever dealt with that, but it doesn't last. For, the people don't last for long. They're, they get tired, and she's got oxygen on. And, and so Susie's responsibility to her family and her mother is there, and she needs to be there to take care of her. And, and, uh, but uh, she sends her love to you. But a lot of families that are out today, as we go through our prayer request today, don't forget to uh, pray for Sister Offord. Uh, Brother Virgil Gibson, Sister Banks, Sister Cadenhead, Gloria Johnson, that entire family, Ben Garrison, and his extended family. Sister Redbird Nance, uh, appreciate her being, uh, Sister Linda being with us today. Sister Barfield and her son, Gary Gray. Uh, I know uh, that, uh, of course, our internet is down and we'll have to record and put it back out there. But Brother Gary sends his love to y'all and y'all be praying for him. Sister White, uh, struggling with cancer. Uh, Sister Barbara Whittington, Susie's mom, mom, needs a healing. Johnny Ann Bell, this is Brother uh, uh, Bobby's mother. Uh, there's, like I said, there's a lot of people that are out of town, people are traveling, some people working cattle this morning. Uh, some people having Christmas with extended family members today, and we pray for all them, and, and, and love goes out to them. And there's some people that are sick, and uh, extended family members that are sick and having to take care of their families. Praying for our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world, our church ministries, our homeschool network, also our missionaries, our country, our military, law enforcement, and the peace of Israel as well. Unspoken requests by the raising of hands. Lost loved ones, let's all pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for every person who's gathered together in church this morning. And Lord, we ask you to minister to them as only you can. Father, you know every name on our prayer list and those that God ex escaped my mind but not my heart. We ask you to touch every one and we lift their hearts up to you, Lord. We ask you to guide them and direct them, comfort them during difficult times, physical sicknesses, mental anguish, God. We ask you to help them. God, those that are get, gathering together, ministering to family and having Christmas celebrations this morning with extended family members, my daughter in Southwest Texas and others and Susie with her mom. We, Lord, we ask you to minister to them and touch them, guide them, protect them. Father, we ask you to touch our brothers and sisters around the world this morning that are being persecuted in horrific ways, thrown in prison and tortured and shamed for the love of Christ. And we ask you, Lord, to minister to them in our church ministries, our homeschool network. God, we ask you to touch our missionaries this morning. That God, that you'll minister to them and protect them and guide them, Lord, that you'll open doors of ministry for them. Praying for our country, Lord, and our military and law enforcement, first responders, and also praying for Jerusalem. We lift up Jerusalem to you, Lord. Father, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Sit up here. You want to sit with Mama? Okay, you can stay up here and listen. I don't care. All right, if you have your Bibles this morning, open your Bibles to. Open your Bibles to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 12. When you get there, say amen. We've also been in the book of Philippians. Also, 1 Peter and finishing up with Psalms. I want to minister to you this morning uh, with the subject title of a heavy mind, a heavy heart. And uh, going into the holiday seasons and difficulties and going on with the holiday seasons. And, and a lot of people suffer during the holidays. And a lot of uh, people have empty nests. They're alone. Family members are gone. Difficulties going on. Uh, divorce. Anxiety is uh, people trying to out do someone else, another family, having to go from this family to this family to this family. I stopped that years ago. But you go over here, and then you have to put up with this family, and then anxiety, and then people start bickering and arguing, trying to purchase gifts when you don't have the money to purchase gifts. It's, listen, Christmas is not about family. It's about Christ. Christmas is not about families. It's not about a tree. It's not about the uh, tinsel. It's not about uh, presents, and they make sure everybody gets a present. It, listen, you can, you can get so ang anxious in the holiday season that you hate it. And it's not, and we've lost the we've lost the direction of it. Christmas is uh, even if you go back and study the history, and it's got some it's got some paganism in it. I know that, but we celebrate as Christians. We celebrate the birth of our Christ. We know any Bible student that studied any type of length of, of biblical studies know Christ was technically would have been born around September, in October time frame because of the, the the sheep in the field. But but that's all right. We're specifically celebrating the birth of our Savior, and to know who our Savior is, and know what He came to do. He's our sin sacrifice. He is to be worshipped and adored and loved. No matter who you are and what you do in life, 
adore him, worship him, and praise him. But you're going to go through difficult times. You've got to let anxiety, financial anxiety, you've got to let those things go. In Proverbs chapter 12, the writer says, The hand of the diligent will rule, but the lazy hand will be put to forced labor. And what a truth. And in verse 25, listen to it very closely, Anxiety in a person's heart weighs it down. There's often time y'all have heavy hearts at times. A lot of the heavy hearts that we have is, of course, we have some sadness and difficulties, but a lot of it is anxiety, excessive work. There, listen, Satan will always make a little mound into a mountain in your mind if you let him do it. it, it, it he'll make it out to be bigger. You got to look at in the, in the circumstances of, of from life, you have two things that's occurred that you can guarantee that's occurred in your life. Every one of us, you were born and you're going to die. You're born and you're going to die. You have a date that was born, that you were born on this planet, and you have a date that you're going to take your last breath. Everything inside of it shouldn't be really worried about at all. Even your death as a Christian shouldn't be worried about because, you know, our, with our, our salvation has been provided for us through Jesus Christ. But when we look at it, uh, people like, I, I admire people like Zach, and I don't really know if it's legit or not, but there's people like Zach on this planet, and then there's people like Joni on this planet. Joni and me are like peas in a pod. If we were married, we'd probably kill each other, and we'd probably sit there, and both of us have meltdowns 24 hours a day. But Zach, and I would be the dominant one. I know you're dominant, but I'd be dominant, sister. I just. But anyway, Zach, nothing bothers Zach. The Joker, and he, he, I remember him calling me one time. He said and he was in a tr his truck, and he had an anxiety attack. And I was like, Zach had an anxiety attack? How does Zach have an anxiety attack? Well, it builds up and builds up. But Zach is so laid back, nothing bothers him. In all the years that we've been together in this church, 19 years together in this church, he, Zach just nothing bothers him. He just, oh, well, okay. I'm sitting there pulling what left hair I got out of my office, and he's like, oh, well, well, ain't nothing. What a way to live. I would have hair on my head. I wouldn't be taking stomach medicine every day. Do you know I never took a stomach pill ever in my life until I started pastoring? Yes, 24 years ago, I started pastoring and my stomach went nuts and I didn't know what it was. And I thought I was dying. I was going to the doctors and acid was coming all up in my chest and my stomach killed me all the time. And I went to the doctor and said, I'm dying. She said, what's wrong? You're 30. You look great. You're 30 years old. What's the matter? I'm dying. So I never felt nothing like this. She started checking me out, started looking and going down my throat. She said, you got, a, you got reflux. I said, what's a reflux? She said, you got acid is coming. You got, you got beginning of ulcers in your stomach. Well, I said, what is an ulcer? I didn't know what none of it was. She said, have you had some life changes lately? I said, yeah, I started pasturing six months ago. <laughs> but anyway, what caught, now you go back and look at that change in my life. Prior to that, I was, prior to the war, before I went to the battlefield, I was laid back, happy-go-lucky. The war messed all that up and made me high, strong, and nutty. But when I, before I started pastoring, I was just working, taking care of my family. I'd preach here and there. I'd preach revivals here and there. But when you stepped in that pulpit and you started taking the responsibility of the pulpit and ministering to the congregation, you have to ask yourself, what caused all my anxiety? What caused my anxiety is I put two people and myself put too much responsibility upon me that wasn't mine to have. Somewhere along the line, I got it in my head, and not being sacri sacrilegious, I actually got it in my head that I was, the, I was God's last person to win the loss. I, I got, Satan got me in this little box that, that, I, that, that no one is ministering the gospel but me. No one's trying to win the loss but me. No, and, and if I don't do it, people are going to hell everywhere, and it's going to be my fault. If people don't come to the altar, it's my fault. If people don't come to prayer meeting. I remember my first prayer meeting that I called for the church, uh, Clay. I, I sat on that pew, right, not this church, but in Mount Vernon. I sat on the pew on the right uh, altar on the right-hand side, and I, I called it it. Six o'clock Sunday night, and I was so excited. My first prayer meeting, I walked out and sat down, and I was just sitting there praying in the Spirit, praying in the Holy Ghost, just waiting for the crowd, all 14 people, to walk through the door. Nobody showed up. Nobody came to prayer meeting. I sat there by myself and prayed all evening, just crying out to God. But you know what? I took that as my fault, my failure. I failed. To lead, and I've only been there like a couple weeks. I failed to lead this church 
to the uh, prayer altar. And then if people don't respond, that pressure, and people go in the nursing home. We had three nursing homes, and I went to every one of them, and it's going from room to room. I went to the hospital, and I walked in to pray with one of the congregants, uh, one of the people in the hospital, at the congregation from the hospital, and I was praying, went in to pray. And then I heard someone crying in another room, and I, I said, well, I can't just walk by that room. I went in and started praying with them. Then I found myself going to every single room, and then I found myself in the ER. Then the nurses got, got a hold of me, and they would call me all through the night and say, this person dying and this we need you over here to come they want a preacher so i had three nurses homes an er a hospital all right down the road from my house the parsonage was built in the church don't do that and then my mind started going crazy i started having anxiety attacks i didn't know what an anxiety attack was i thought i was dying having a heart attack i went to the er said i'm dying they said you look good to me i said no you don't understand i'm dying and they started hooking me up and everything. They said, no, your heart's fine. There's nothing. You have an anxiety attack. I said, what's an anxiety attack? What caused all that stuff? I'm talking, if you, if you have anxiety and you have depression and you put a smile on for everybody, the pastor and the ministers, you have to look good for everybody every day because you're there to minister to the people. You're not there to be ministered to. Does everybody understand that? Say Amen. Well, when you have a family and you're the man of the family or you're the mom of the family, you have to put the face on for your family and extended family and for your kids and everything's okay when everything's not okay. And you have to hide it for everybody. But what causes the anxiety and what causes the, the depression, and, and, and I'm not talking about physical issues, but I'm talking about emotional issues that's caused by stress. What causes that? Because we put stuff on us that we're not responsible for. I can't save nobody on this planet. I remember walking around one prayer meeting and nobody was there and I was on the right hand of the church and I fell to the floor. I was so overwhelmed, I just fell to the floor and cried out to God and I was bawling like crazy. I said, God, you've got to come back now. There's too many people going to hell and I can't win them all. Who put that responsibility on me? And then I'd preach grace for everybody else and law for me. If people didn't show up it was to church, it was my fault. If people didn't come to prayer meeting, it was my fault. If people didn't tithe, it was my fault. If people didn't hang out and, and want to eat, it was my fault. My fault, my fault, my fault, my fault. And then Satan started the act, yeah, it is your fault. You're a pathetic preacher. Why do you think you're called? Who do you think you are? Blah, 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 blah. Person dies in the ER. I remember they called me like at 2 in the morning. Said, hey, Brother, Nat, Brother Matt, can you come over here? There's a man dying and the family's calling for a, a minister. So I got up and got dressed. Now it was about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And I told Sister Susie, I said, look, I, uh, you, you might want to come with me. And we lived across the street. They'll build a church across the street in the hospital. Anyway, so I went across over there. And I go into the ER. And these people are all in there crying and bawling. And, and I walk in and they say, are you the preacher? I said, yes, I, I'm the minister. Would you please pray for my husband? He's had a heart attack. So because of the relationship they allowed me to go into the back where they're actually er working on people and i'd go back in there and they're doing cpr on this man and they had a whole crew around him and they shocking him and the doctor another doctor standing there watching and telling everybody what to do and i'm standing by him and and i told him so i'm going to pray for him he said go ahead and pray for him and i put my hand on his head and i started crying out to god and praying in the holy ghost because if he's praying tongues see god listens to you more that's what i used to think and i so i was praying in the holy ghost loud and all the people thought who is this crazy man and i'm laying my hands on i said god raise him up and show your power to these people that dude died right there I sat down on the bed beside him and the doctor sat down beside me he said you going out to tell the family I looked at him and said I ain't the doc you the doctor he said he looked down at me he said you the preacher I said girl so I went out there into the, into the foyer area the ER waiting room area and the little wife come up to me, and she said, is he okay? And I said, no, Mama, he's gone. And she just collapsed to the ground, started bawling. I started bawling. I hit the ground. I picked, trying to wrap my arms around her, trying to hold her. And I kept, you know what I said to her? I'm so sorry. I failed. I failed. Because in the Bible, when you lay hands on someone, they rise up. But in reality, they don't always rise up. But I thought they would if I laid hands on, especially because, see, God to get his glory. See, God raised this man up. The church would explode and be full instead of running 14 people on Sunday morning. See, see and we'd win thousands and thousands of people to Jesus. And we'd build orphanages all around the world. And we'd feed the homeless all over the world. See, just one man raised from the dead, God, all this would happen. You know what happened? 
I quit the ministry right there. I turned around, walked out, beat down. Satan's been beating on me and killing me. I looked at Sue and said, I'll never preach again. I'm done. I'm finished. And I went into the house and I told her, I said, I'll resign Sunday. This was like on Monday. Well, around Thursday, a letter came in the mail. And it was from that woman, the mother or the wife. And I got it somewhere. She wrote a beautiful letter saying, I thank God that he sent his angel to help me through the horrible time of my life. Mm. See, God was using me. I just didn't realize it. See, when we start putting performance on us as men and women of God and men and women in households, that our performance and our performance, our performance, our performance, our performance. Are we performing good as a husband? Are we performing good as a wife? Are we per performing as a minister? Are we performing performance, 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 and anxiety where you don't enjoy nothing because all you're trying to do is reach some fi fictitious level of success in your mind that God has never put on you. But you put it on, people put, you, let people put it on you, and then Satan stirs it all up. And anxiety becomes actually how you live 24 hours a day. And in modern times, back in the old days, they use, they use alcohol and use opium and different things. And today, the, you, you go to the doctor and you can get drugs to calm yourself all down. And I'm not against that. But the problem is, is a lot of it's caused by our own selves. I know there's phys medical issues, physical issues that cause that. That's okay. But a lot of it is, is we, we sit there day in and day out, and we put more pressure on us, and we put pressure on our children thinking they're supposed to be perfect, and they're supposed to be this, measured up to who? You're trying to measure up your life to somebody else all the time, and God has never told you to do that. You're not supposed to compare yourself to another minister because you're unique. You're, you're a unique minister to God. You're a unique parent to God. You're a unique individual to God. God would have died for you. You are special to him, and he loves you, and he cares about you, and you put more prayer. He said, I never told you. I never asked you. The system's doing that to you. Quit. Then you have to have the perfect wife, and you have to have the perfect children. I remember when the Martins, I love the Martins to death. They had like 20 kids, and every time they come around us, every one of them kids had the Bible memorized. My kids are sitting there. My daughter's got a finger up her nose. My little boy is sitting there playing with a truck, and Robbie's with his head back asleep. And the Martin kids are all standing up here quoting the Word of God verbatim, and I can't even do that. And you know what I start thinking? I'm a failure. So I started telling my kids, memorize this. I want you to memorize this. I want you to, I'd walk by Robbie's room, and he'd be sitting there uh, looking at his baseball cards. I said, read the book of Ephesians tonight. Okay. Robbie read about two minutes and he's done. Now, Matt can read all night long. But see, I was putting pressure on them, trying to make them something that only God can do. I can't make them men and women of God. Only, you can serve God and be in love with God and be a great man and woman of God and never know one scripture memorized in your life. But if I had testimony service, somebody knew a testimony, they'd memorize scripture, stand up so they can quote scripture, and everybody go, oh, that's just wonderful. Well, a parrot can quote scripture. That doesn't mean they have him in his heart. We put too much pressure on ourselves, and we try to perform, and you go to district meetings, and you go to sectional meetings, and you go to this meeting, you go to business meetings, and, and everybody wants to look successful, and everybody's comparing, and it just, it's, it's not real. It's fake. you got to figure out what's real and what's not, and hold on to the real and let the fluff go. You know, we get these pies and got all that, you know, you got coconut pie. Help me out, Nana. Coconut pie. And that's you, Nana, your mama. It has about that much meringue. meringue. Thank you, Michael. I didn't know you knew anything about that. Yo, cow holler. You educated. You must have went to school where I went to school. Do you know Michael from Redwater too? He's just a little bit behind us. You got that much meringue and you got about that much pie. You understand what I'm trying to show you? That stuff sitting on top is just for looks and a little flavor, but it ain't going to do nothing for you. You got to work yourself past all that fluff and get down to the nitty-gritty and start figuring out what's in the pie because that's what really matters, isn't it? That fluff don't mean nothing. 
And if you concentrate on the fluff all the time, you get overwhelmed with anxiety and have anxiety attacks and depression. You can't even get, I can remember battling depression where I couldn't even get out of bed. I laid in bed for three days in Mount Vernon. Three days. The idea of getting up and brushing your teeth was so overwhelming, I couldn't do it. The idea of just getting up and combing your hair was like walking up a mountain. But nobody knows you go through that because you had to put a face on them and smile for everybody. I remember Brother Liddell, preacher friend of mine, he, the Lord put me on his heart and he called me up. Day three, he called me up and he said, Brother Matt, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm actually laying in bed and I've been here for three days. He said, I know. And then I got mad because I thought Susie called him. And she didn't. He said, my first pastor about killed me. And I went through the same thing you're going through. But you are going to get better. And when he said you're going to get better, it was like a thousand pounds fell off my back. And he said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to get out of that bed, get your shower, get cleaned up. And I want you to start walking two miles a day and just listen to Christian music while you do it. And just unwind. He said, he said, all this is going to pass. And when he said that, it's like everything started getting better. And there was a man down the road, Brother Martin, pastor church, Lake Chapel, house of prayer down the road. And I went by and I was just all beat up. And, and I went by and, and visited him. I walked in, in there and looked at him and I started crying. I said, I can't handle this. I can't handle this. And he teared up with me and I fell to the floor and he got on the floor with me and I laid in his lap. And he held me against his chest and he cried with me. And he, you know what he said to me? He said, that church was there before you showed up, and it'll be there when you're gone. And when he said, when you're gone, I couldn't fathom that because, see, Jesus is coming back tomorrow, and everybody's going to hell, and nobody's dedicated to God. Nobody's dedicated to the work of God. Nobody wants to do missions work. Nobody wants to. I remember asking the secretary, wouldn't you want God just to call you to run an orphanage in Africa? And she's like, no, I would never go to Africa. I'm like, are you even saved? But if you're not careful, you'll let other people dampen your call and your love for God. You'll never be able to do that. And if Satan, you think Satan's going to let you get away with it? You think Satan is going to sit back and let you love God without a fight? Do you think the enemy of your soul is, not, is just going to sit back while you're pleading with people to fall in love with Jesus and be born again? Do you think Satan's going to leave you alone? Put on the full armor of God. Why, do you, why does the Bible say put on the full armor of God? Because you're fixing to go through hell. But when you look at all the people up here in, in nice suits and all this stuff, and we're, you think, well, they just, I remember my mom one time was struggling, and she looked at me, and she said, she, she said but you're such a great man of faith, son. And I, I, I said, Mama, you are too. And I hung up the phone. And I sat there and just trying to figure out how I'm going to breathe. See. I remember I went and stayed with Mom and Dad for a week because I couldn't function. I couldn't stay. And I was losing my family. How many of y'all know what Terrell is? Terrell, mental hospital, state hospital. I thought for sure I was going to Terrell. Either that or go. I didn't know what the VA was back then, brother. But the VA would have put me on the 10th floor or 9th floor. Old brother Tankersley used to go to church, great friend of mine, gone on to be with Jesus now. He told me in that office, he said, be careful what you tell them down there at the VA hospital. They'll lock you behind up. And I got lost and got on the wrong floor, and all them boys were walking around in pajamas. I got back on the elevator. <laughs> <laughs> this ain't my floor yet. And I remember staying with mom and daddy, and daddy... Daddy being the good daddy that he was and the good father that he is, he looked at me and said, well, maybe you need to take, I haven't been pastoring about eight months at this time. He said, won't you take about two years off and regroup? <laughs> I'd say the same thing to my babies. Susie's parents, they did what they're supposed to do. They said, are you really called? Why? Because you're not supposed to struggle if you're called? The enemy's going to fight you. And he's going to do everything he can to destroy you. And sometimes you're going to fall. And you're going to have anxiety. You're going to have depression. And you think you're weak if you do. You're not weak. You're just a target. 
But you have to go back and look, why am I allowing this? What's really wearing me out? And then you have to refocus in what's wearing you out and get rid of the fluff and get down to the pie. And stay at the pie. Because if you stay at the pie, that big pie go really is this big. You realize that? That big fluffy pie, I don't know if they got one next door or not, but this big gigantic pie really ain't but right here. And we concentrate on what we see rather than what is good. In verse 25, it says, anxiety in a person's heart weighs it down. We're weighed down, worrying all the time. Wonder if they think I'm doing good enough. Wonder if they're, if they're talking about me when I'm not there. Wonder if they're saying anything positive about me. You got to get to the point to where you only care about one person's opinion about you, and that's God. You got to get to the point you give a flip-flop about anybody on this planet's opinion but God himself. As long as God's excited and happy about you, which he is, obviously, then don't worry about what they're saying. Because most, 99.9% people are busy body and nosy, and they just want drama, and they're running their mouth. Just like I got a phone call that, Randy, uh, that, that Ricky was dead, and it came from a, one, a young girl that thought she heard it, and the other woman thought she heard it, and thought she heard it from her mother, and it wasn't true. I'm not saying they were busy bodies. It, a member of the congregation died. They started calling everybody. That's normal. But what I'm saying is a lot of this, you worry about people's opinions about yourself so much. Quit worrying about people's opinions and then just concentrate on what God's word says about you. And go look and see what God's word. You're beautifully, wonderfully made, fearfully made. You're wonderful. He only has good thoughts about you. He loves you. He died for you. Who cares what that person thinks? Do you, you know why you care is you hold people in too much respect and thought in your life. If they're not going to help build you, get them out. I'm not saying divorce your husband. I'm just saying, <laughs> Brother Matt said I can leave you. I didn't say that. What I am saying is that you need to pay attention and make sure that nothing is in your life that's weighing you down that's negative all the time, but rather be positive in some way, form, or fashion. Amen? Amen? It goes on and says this. It says uh, in Philippians 4 and 6, do not be anxious about anything. Look at what the writer says. Be an- do not be anxious about anything. Don't be anxious about nothing. That's what he said. Why? Why, does Paul, why is Paul telling us that? Why is he telling the church in Philippi? Because that brother had pressure on him. He had the Jews, his brotherhood, trying to kill him, and he's just trying to save them. He's trying to minister to the Gentiles, and they're listening to the Jews, getting circumcised, and listening to them that saying he's not really a prophet or not really an apostle. The constant battle. Then he's got his own brethren within the community of Christianity want to know, why are you hanging out with them, Paul? And then you got the enemy fighting him all the time. Then he said, do you understand that a majority of the New Testament written by Paul himself was in prison? Nobody's going to Bible college for that role. Nobody wants to get credential and say, I'm willing to sit in prison and write a third of the, almost two thirds of the New Testament. They'll say, they'll get a lawyer and get themselves out. They'll say, well, God didn't call me to that. There's a man named Tucker that was built, was trying to minister the gospel, and I forget the whole story about him, but he was trying to minister the gospel years ago. Back in the old days, missionaries carried their caskets with them when they went overseas because they knew they weren't coming back. Be anxious about nothing. If God wants it, it'll happen. You try to force something, you're going to mess it up, and you're going to get all anxious and worried and, and Worrisome about it. You can't change nothing. He goes on and says, be anxious about nothing, but in everything, everything. So he says, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and pleading thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. You got to give it to prayer. I'm not talking about praying out loud here and praying here where everybody can see. I'm talking about get along with God where nobody else is around and open your heart and open your mouth and talk to God who not only created you but come flesh and died for you as a sin offering so that you can be in relationship with him. Talk to him and let him know how you feel because he lives within you and he already knows how you feel anyway and you need to tell him all about it. You know what happens? He'll establish you. He'll bring you peace. Why? Because you're giving it to him. I can't change this. I can't fix this. I can't do this. You can. Please help me. And he will help you. 
If you don't, you're going to be like Israel. And when Israel should have cried out to God and trusted God, he went to Egypt. They went to Egypt. And they made alliance with Egypt. And God's like, what are you doing? Come to me. I took care of you. You're trying to make an alliance with Egypt, which is pagan, which is not, doesn't have anything to do with me. And you're trusting Egypt to take care of you over me? That's what Israel did. And God taught them to trust him. Do you realize if you don't trust God, he'll teach you to trust God? If you don't trust him, he'll teach you to trust him? Do you understand that? And, we, and I, it's, not a, it's not a warning He's going to do that because he's your father and he loves you and he cares about you. And he's going to teach you to trust him. So he's going to allow things in your life to where you have nobody else to rely on but him. And if you've got somebody in your life that you rely on more than God in your heart, he will make sure he fixes it. And that's not a bad thing because he's a jealous God. And that's not an evil jealousy. That's a loving jealousy. That's a love relationship. He hovers over your heart with a love that's not of this world. See, God's love is, is, is an unconditional love. And when we say that God so loved the world, and we quote John 3, 16, he so loved the world. Who's the world? That's people that don't know him. That's your, that's your people out in this world that do not know him nor cry out to him or have a relationship with him. God loves them. And he, and he wants to be with them. So what did he do? He gave his only begotten son. So what? He, he become flesh to do what? So he can be in relationship with them. God loves them but can't be in relationship with them without them being in Christ. And I was going to go somewhere else with that. I'm going to go back now. It, it, it be anxious about anything, about, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything. So everything in your life, you go to God with it in prayer. Everything. Get along with him and talk to him. He loves you. He loved you before. That's where I was going. He loves you before you ever knew him. So how much more that now that you're in the beloved or your relationship with, he knows what makes you think. He, tick, he knows what you worry about. He knows what you care about. He knows what you struggle with. He knows the temptations of sin that's upon you. So sit with him and talk to him. And you don't have to have a pastor to do it either. Everybody thinks the pastor is your connection to God. Not everybody, but I'm not your connection to God. I'm a friend of the bridegroom. I sit back. Here he is over here. Here you over here. My job is to point you to him and tell them about him. There, I am nowhere in between this relationship. I am out here. I have my own unique relationship with him, just me and him. That's right. And if I could fix it, I would be somewhere on an Isle of Patmos with me and just him. Amen. You think that was bad that John was on the Isle of Patmos as a, as a prisoner? No, it was good. You got the book of Revelation. Besides that, listen to what it said. And on the Lord's day, I was in the spirit. He was with the Lord. That's far better than being with a human. When you start making alliances with Egypt, you start making mistakes. When you let loneliness and depression and anxiety build up, you start doing stupid stuff that you should never do in reality. Philippians 4 and 6, be saints about in anything, but in everything by prayer and pleading with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. 1 Peter 5 and 7, look what he says. Having cast all your anxiety upon all your cares upon him. Why do you do that? Because he cares about you. King James, cast all your cares upon him. He wants to carry the burden. He wants to know. He wants to fellowship with you. He wants to talk to you. Tell him you're anxious. You're struggling with a temptation of sin? Go talk to God about it. He already knows. What is done in dark, God sees. But do you realize what's thought and done in dark God saw when he died for you? Do you realize when he saved you and called you? And touched you and healed you and caressed you and loved you. He still thought, but he still did it anyway. Why? Because God loves you. And every one of us have to have the blood of Jesus constantly being shed for us. First John 1, 9. If we're in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Christ is constantly flowing. You need the blood just as much flowing for you today as you did the day you cried out to the Lord. And anybody don't think you do, you're in wrong relationship with God. Cast all your anxiety upon him, all your cares upon him. Don't call 
this counselor all the time or this person over, or, or over here run to the dog. I, I'm, not, I'm not against medicine, but medicine just masks it. It's still there. It just masks it, but it also has side effects. I was talking, one, you gain a bunch of weight, some of them. If I was talking to a friend of mine, he's a pre- pastor friend of mine, he just couldn't deal with nothing no more. And he said, man, I, got, I had to get on some mess, and it was, I mean, I was about to lose it here. And I looked at him like, really? And I'm crazy. <laughs> but I couldn't let him know that. I had to act all spiritual. But I'm sitting there going, I'm a nut job myself, brother. What'd you get? <laughs> so what was that again? <laughs> He said, I'm, I have to stop taking it. I said, why? He said, because it makes you think everything is fine. Nothing's ever wrong. Everything's okay. I said, what do you mean? He said, sort of like if I could just stand on the roof and jump off, it'd be okay. And I said, bro, that's not good. He said, I know. It's not good. I got to get off that stuff. So you have to be careful. Doctors make money. Doctors make money. They get kickbacks from pharmaceutical companies pushing their meds. Be careful. I'm not against it, but be careful. You'd be surprised what walking two miles and letting some junk go and talking to God would take care of. Amen. Psalms 38:18 says this. Musicians come back. Psalms 38, 18 says this, for I admit my guilt. Listen, listen to this. For I admit my guilt, I am full of anxiety because of my sin. Look what he wrote. Look at the psalmist wrote. I am full of anxiety because of my sin. Do you know why sin causes anxiety? Because you know it's wrong. Now, the Christian knows it's wrong. But the non-Christian doesn't know it's wrong. The non-Christian just lives their life based on their own opinion how they want to live. But the Christian... The Christian knows right from wrong because he who says right and wrong is in their heart. So when an individual sins against God, it causes anxiety in their spirit. It causes anxiety in their mind because, one, they're worried about sinning against God because they love God. But look what the psalmist said. I admit my guilt. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if I confess my sin, he is faithful and just to forgive me of my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. What does that mean? It means to the Christian, when you sin against God. Now, there's people that says you won't sin against God if you're really Christian. That's a lie. That's a lie. It's not written in the Bible. There's no such thing as perfected sanctification. You're as sanctified and as holy as you will ever be the day you got saved. How do you know that, Brother Matt? Because I know the Scriptures. You are, when, you were born in God, when you're born of God, the Holy Spirit baptized you into Jesus. In other words, he placed you in the body of Christ. You were hanging on the cross with Christ. You died with Christ. You were buried with Christ. You resurrected with Christ. With Christ. We publicly confess this with water baptism. Everybody understand it? Say amen. When you exhibited a measure of faith by saying, God, help me. God, save me. You don't have to pray 50 miles. You don't have to come to the front of the church. Nobody has to write your name in the logbook in the church. Nobody has to lay hands on you. The minute you exhibit faith in your heart towards God, Help me. Save me. Oh, God. He's going to give you the Christ so you can be in relationship with him. You cannot be in relationship with God without the Christ. So now that you have a relationship with him, now he can start comforting and start teaching you and start guiding you. Inst- when, when, that, the, when God puts it in here and you're in the beloved, the relationship is closer now. I got fully sanctified. I got fully justified. Justified is a legal term, which means you, you're made right in the eyes of God if, if you've never sinned. How many of y'all realize that? Say amen. amen. In the eyes of God, you are as right as you're ever going to be in his eyes because of Christ and the blood of Christ that not only washed your sins away, but rendered the sin nature ineffective in a sense. It doesn't have, you don't have to be a slave to it no more. But also, he imputed the righteousness of Christ in you. So the righteousness that Father sees is Christ's righteousness. You try to add to that, you commit spiritual adultery. In other words, you're trying to say, you're saying, God, you didn't do it good enough. I've added this. I've added my church attendance. I've added my Bible study. I've added my, my ministry. I've added all the hours I spend in serving you around the world. Yet your anxiety is about to kill you. 
And you add all that in saying this plus Christ. See, that's what false churches do, false teachers do. They, they go Christ plus, Paul said, circumcision. The modern church says water baptism, speaking in tongues, church attendance, Bible study, showing up to prayer meeting. That's what makes you saved. The real church is Sunday night and Wednesday. The fluff church is on Sunday morning. That's not true at all. That's man's dogma and man's law. And people fall into it and they yoke the congregation with church attendance. They yoke the congregation with a certain style of dress. They yoke them thinking they're serving God and they're not. But somewhere along the line, you've you're, you got to realize you're justified. That anxiety. See, when you realize you're sanctified and judged, sanctified just simply means separated from the master's use, deemed holy. Who did that? Not you. You didn't do it. You didn't justify yourself before God. Jesus did. You just exhibited faith. Now, there is truth and progressive sanctification. And what that means, it's very simple. He prunes you as a branch connected to the vine. He simply cuts away the stuff that hinders the relationship over periods of time. Some of y'all raised to serve God all your life, raised in godly homes. You got less baggage. But there's other people that have been abused and molested all their life and been, been treated like garbage and Hated, and they got tons of garbage and, and tons of luggage in their life. And God has got to unpack all that stuff. And it takes a little bit longer. Amen. But the church, be careful because you start looking around and saying, she ain't fitting in the way she's supposed to. She ain't doing something like she's supposed to. And then y'all start frowning her and sending her out. I got a phone call and I'm fixing to be done. Tick me off. I got a phone call from a very dear friend. He said, Brother Matt, I need to talk to you. I'm just going to come down here since I'm ticked off now. He said, Brother Matt, I need to talk to you. I'm like, what? Now. <laughs> he said, I need to find out if this is biblical or not. I said, what? I got a friend of mine. She's a young lady. She has three kids with her husband. Well, technically, they've never been married, but they've been together forever, and they've got three little children. Well, she wanted to start going to church with the kids, and he wouldn't go with her. But he wa she wanted to go, so she started going to this little Assembly of God church. And she walked in, and she was sitting there doing good, and everybody was just loving on her. She was doing great. She was coming. Well, she went to the altar and got saved, and all the women grabbed around her and was crying out to God. And she cried out to the Lord and got saved, and she was so excited. And they scheduled a baptism service, and she went to the pastor and said, I want to be baptized. And he said, you can't get baptized because you're not married to your husband. I said, you call that preacher because I have a few men in my church and we're going to go beat him to death. <laughs> he ran her off. She's back out. You know what I told him? You tell that young lady to bring herself to this church and I will baptize her the Sunday she walks in that door. So she can make a confession to Christ publicly. And you know who's going to clean that up? The Holy Spirit will. And you loving her. And you helping her kids. And when her live-in husband that's not married to her walks in that door, she finally gets him to come. You grab his hand and you hug him and love him. And you know what will happen? Hey, Brother Matt, we need to get married. Would you marry us? Yes, I will. That man probably will never walk into a church again, ever. Or her. All because of people thinking they know what they're doing and they don't. Ask yourself, what would Jesus have done? What would Christ have done? He'd have hugged her, embraced her. If she asked, he'd said, get married. But that pure little heart that's fresh and brand new, babe in Christ, just wanted to be baptized publicly. She was so excited. And her little kids would have followed right along. And her husband would have probably come right in after, got saved too, and then looked at his wife and said, we have to be married. And probably would have grown and been a great deacon and deacon wife and Sunday school teachers in that church. Instead, Satan's laughing at them, mocking them, and they're out in the world. 
It'd be better that those people and that preacher never knew God than what they're fixing to stand before God for. Now, were they ignorant about it? I hope so. I hope they're just ignorant. Because if their heart's malicious, I think Jesus called them den of vipers. Somewhere around there. Something like that. Your anxiety, if not checked, will kill you. It'll put you in the grave long or quicker than you should be there. It'll make you get overweight because you eat. How do you know that, Brother Matt? Because I sit. When I get anxiety and I get overwhelmed, depressed, you know what I do? I go buy this big, gigantic thing of strawberry ice cream. And I sit my behind right in front of a Western, and I go this right here, ice cream. And then I find out why is it empty, and I give me another one. My mom and dad bought me a whole box of Nutter Butter ice cream cones. I ate like four of them suckers through one Western. And then your body's going to start giving away, and your heart will give away, and your stomach will get ate up. And you throw a pill. Put a pill in your stomach so you can stay stressed down all the time. How about alleviate the stress? How about chill? How about you can only do what you can do? How about quit putting more responsibility on you than you can, than you're supposed to? Quit worrying about everybody's opinion about you all the time. Just fall in love with the Lord. Take your cares to Him. Spend time with Him. Listen, before you become a servant, you were a son. Man told me that standing right there, missionary friend of mine. I was stressed out. I don't remember what it was. Somebody was gripping at me about something. People gripped about me. I mean, they just, bro, you think you got one wife? I have, I have 140. <laughs> and I said, dude, man, I'm stressed. He said, remember you're a son before you're a servant. Right? You're a son to God before you're a husband and a father. Can't be the husband and father if you forget the son relationship. You start going through motions, mechanics, trying to survive, trying to make it. When he's been sitting over on a stump waiting on you to come talk to him. What's the point of doing all the ministry in the world and hating every second of it? Right? What's the point of working cattle and hating every second of it? If you get rid of the, let God take the anxiety and the nervousness and all that stuff. People, people come and say, brother, Matt, you seem angry all the time. I'm not angry. I'm just stressed out. <laughs> but he's the one that can help you. And he's the only one that can help you. The pill covers it up. Counselors just get paid to keep you in there longer because they get paid by the hour. We'll talk about this in our next session. We ain't talk about nothing this session. Now we got Christian counselors. I thought that was the pastor's job. <laughs> I got a friend, I got a pastor friend of mine. I don't counsel nobody. You're the pastor. I'm the pastor. I'm not a counselor. I said, yes, you are, bro. He said, nope, I've never been to school for counseling. I said, you ain't got to go to school, but here's Brother Matt's counseling. We open the Bible, and it says this. There you go. There's your counsel session. Well, I just feel so alone. So do I. You're not by yourself. You know what makes people feel good? They're not by themselves. And when they find out that your pastor's as screwed up as you are, everybody goes, thank God, I'm not lost. <laughs> Everybody stand. Father, we thank you. We praise you. We glorify you. We magnify your name above all names. Lord, you're tender to us. You love us. We praise you. We glorify you. All the stress and anxiety will fall off one day when we stand there before you and be with you. Lord, you have great thoughts about us and you love us. Forgive us of our sin. Forgive us of our excessive worry, our anxiety. Father, we ask you to heal our minds, heal our emotions, and heal our bodies. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Sing to us, brother. Counts the stars, one and all. He knows how much sand is on the shore. Sees every sparrow that falls. May the mountains and the seas is in control of everything. Of all creatures, great and small. Every step that I take, every move that I make, every tear that I cry, He knows my name, and I'm overwhelmed by the pain. Can't see the light of day, I know I'll 
Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning. God bless your heart. Your dinner is ready. You got a crew over there waiting to minister to you. Listen to me. 